when I was a kid, I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau, the world-famous undersea explorer. He was my hero, so I learned how to scuba dive, and I memorized every fish species and coral species that I could. I knew that this was my future. I knew it was my passion. And that's what I wanted to be when I grew up, an oceanographer. But funny things happen when you go to college. And I got a summer internship for my home state senator, John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, and a great American hero. And after about three weeks downstairs in the mailroom running the auto pen, that signed all the constituent mail, I went upstairs to the legislative director and I said, could you give me a research project? And he said, sure, on what? And I said, anything, because what I'm doing now is so boring. And he said, all right, why don't you look into the NPT? And I said, I'm on it. In those days, however, before the internet or search engines, I had no idea what this meant. It took me the rest of the day in the library to discover NPT stands for Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and thus was born my second passion, nuclear energy and nuclear security. And I've been working on that ever since in academia and government, writing books and so forth. Now, I never thought that my two passions would converge, but they did. Around 2005, I found myself scuba diving in the Caribbean, enjoying the flora and fauna. And then I saw a stretch of obviously dead coral, white, bleached, some of it covered in algae, no fish. And I thought, this is really wrong. But I didn't know anything about what had caused this. But of course, now we do know about massive coral, coral bleaching events. These massive coral bleaching events used to happen once every 20 or 25 years. Now it's once every five or six years. The world's reefs will not survive this. And we know it's caused by the warming of the oceans and the acidification that comes with it. That's all a product of climate change. Now I'm sure each and every one of you have had your own coral reef moment whether you saw the devastating wildfires in California or the drought that afflicted the farmers in the Southwest or the hurricanes that afflicted those in Puerto Rico and more recently the Bahamas. And we all know something's badly wrong and that collectively we need to do something about it because the consequences of not doing anything are so grave for our planet. In 2009, at the U.S. Department of Energy, I found I had another opportunity to address one of my passions by investing in clean energy because the administration was very focused on investing in solar power and wind power. We put $30 billion of loan guarantee to work. We invested early in Tesla electric vehicles and they prepaid their loan. We invested in the first grid-scale solar photovoltaic plant in the United States and started a whole industry. We invested in the largest wind farm in the country, in geothermal, in biorefineries, in battery technology, and we were making a difference. But in the midst of all this, at the U.S. Department of Energy, I got a phone call from the White House, and they said, you have to go to Vienna because we have to try to talk Iran into giving up 1,200 kilograms of low enriched uranium that they had created and maybe trade some 20% enriched uranium to send back to the Tehran research reactor so they could make medical radioisotopes. And this may seem confusing until you remember that originally the U.S. Department of Energy was the Manhattan Project and that even today the Department of Energy is the custodian of the U.S. nuclear arsenal, responsible to keep it safe, secure, and effective. And as I was in Vienna in the middle of these nuclear security talks, thinking back about what we were trying to do in Washington on the climate change side, it occurred to me that we were really in that department facing two existential threats. On the one hand, 
the risk of potentially catastrophic climate change, and on the other, the possible of nuclear weapons proliferation and the security challenges that would present to the world. And it occurred to me that both of these existential threats had very intimate connections to atomic fission, and that to solve both of these threats would require American leadership. Now, on the security side, the story goes all the way back to President Eisenhower. In 1953, he launched the Atoms for Peace initiative, which basically promised to spread the benefits of the peaceful use of the atom around the world in exchange for promises not to divert that assistance to military uses. And we spawned a whole series of international treaties and safeguards that still today form the cornerstone of global nonproliferation efforts. And U.S. diplomacy was critical throughout that period to persuading countries to stay away from nuclear weapons. When the Soviet Union broke up, U.S. diplomats helped persuade Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine to give their nuclear weapons up to Russia. So we ended up with one, not four nuclear weapon states. U.S. diplomacy led Muammar Gaddafi to give up his nuclear weapons program led to the UN Special Commission inspections that rooted out Saddam Hussein's nuclear program after the first Gulf War, worked on North Korea, worked on Iran. So that leadership role was clear. But what about on climate change? Well, think about those coral reefs. If the world manages to limit the temperature rise from pre-industrial levels to about two degrees centigrade in this century, we're probably going to lose 99% of the world's coral reefs. And if we do much better and manage to keep climate change to 1.5 degrees centigrade rise, we may save 20% of those reefs. And if you take all of the pledges that led to the Paris Climate Agreement, which embeds those 1.5 degree and 2 degree targets in its terms, and assume every pledge is redeemed 100%. We will miss the 2 degree target by a country mile. We may hit 4 degrees, it may be higher, we don't really know. And that assumes massive deployment of wind, solar, reforestation efficiency. And the only way to close the gap, to have a shot at 2 degrees, much less 1.5 degrees, is with a significant expansion of nuclear energy, like probably a doubling of nuclear energy. So can we get there? Well, on the one hand, nuclear power is a prodigious source of carbon-free electricity. In this country, for example, 20% of our electricity comes from nuclear power. But over half of our carbon-free electricity comes from nuclear power. But at the same time, nuclear power is severely challenged in this country. Markets do not recognize its unique attributes, the fact that it is carbon-free, the fact that nuclear power plants keep running even in the midst of a hurricane, even when a polar vortex in the upper Midwest may shut down coal and gas plants. So the markets don't recognize its resilience, and therefore, even though we had about 104 nuclear power plants operating in this country, we're now down to 97. So we're going in the wrong direction. Globally, if current trends continue, we're going to lose 40% of our nuclear power by 2040. So what can we do if we do want to have a chance of making those global climate targets a reality to get nuclear back on track? Well, here's a few ideas for your consideration. Number one, Focus on the carbon. The issue isn't wind or solar or hydro or nuclear. The issue is carbon. And we need to remember that as we're designing our policies. Take California, for example. In 2011, California got 53% of its electricity from clean sources, non-carbon emitting sources. Then came a massive expansion of wind power and solar. California is a national leader in renewables. And just last week, the evidence came out showing that in 2018, seven years later, the percentage of clean energy in California is still 
that's to say zero progress. And that's because renewable energy is replacing other carbon-free forms of energy, such as nuclear and hydro. That's not how you get to zero. And that's where we have to get, because electricity consumption around the world is rising. It's going to rise about 100% by 2050. And by that time, scientists tell us we have to decarbonize electricity generation completely. So instead of having renewable energy standards, we should have clean energy standards and put a burden on carbon, because that's where the problem is. Second, we need to invest in nuclear innovation. Over 50 startup companies have attracted over $1.3 billion of private capital to invest in new nuclear technologies. They're using different fuel forms. They're using passive safety features. These reactors burn at lower pressures, at lower temperatures, so that if there is a loss of coolant episode or a loss of power, the reactors will shut down safely with no emission of radiation. The US Department of Energy is investing over a billion dollars a year in these advanced technologies. The Department of Defense is looking at microreactors that can use some of these technologies for remote locations where you need secure, safe sources of power. Third, we need to start deploying these advanced nuclear technologies. We need to build. After the Three Mile Island episode in 1979, for 30 years, the United States did not build a commercial nuclear power reactor. We got out of practice. So when we started to build again, the costs were higher, delays were encountered, and that's not the way to expand the production of nuclear power at a time when we badly need to double the amount that's deployed. So we need to get back into building, get the supply chain restored, rebuild the talent pool, and that will be helpful in achieving our goal. Fourth, we have to deal with the waste challenge. Now, first of all, in terms of dimension, this is a challenge that is within bounds. That is to say, if you took all of the nuclear waste generated since the beginning of the nuclear age in the United States, it would fill one football field about seven yards deep. The challenge is not the size. The challenge isn't even the technology. We know how to contain that in geologic formations for millennia. The challenge is political. Nobody wants a repository in their backyard. But here we could take a page from the Europeans. Because if you go to a place like Finland or Sweden, you'll find that they took a different whole approach to nuclear waste management. They went to the communities. They educated people. They took a consent-based approach to nuclear waste. And they ended up finding, in both countries, two communities willing to host repositories. In Sweden, the two communities were competing for the opportunity to host this repository. And finally, the United States needs to be out there exporting nuclear power. Remember, we need to see a doubling if we want to achieve our global climate objectives. There's about 400 reactors, over 400 reactors, in the world today. Nuclear power is a reality. Over 50 reactors are being built internationally. The US order book for exports of nuclear reactors in an industry that we invented is now zero. So if we get out there and start selling US technology, not only will it help our own industry get back on its feet, but since the United States has safety standards second to none, it will help make sure that in new countries that are developing nuclear power, that they also use those very high safety standards that we all need. And think back on the Eisenhower vision. The United States developed the whole system of international safeguards. And perhaps the most important why you want US exports of nuclear power reactors is because if we're not out there in that venue selling our reactors, then somebody else is going to be writing the rules for nonproliferation. And I, for one, would wish to see the most stringent standards for nonproliferation propagated across the world. And the way we do that is with nuclear exports, each one of which carries all of the obligations of all of the laws the United States has passed on nonproliferation.
tall order. Can we do it? Well, think of what Americans have done in the face of a challenge in the past. In 1939, the United States produced 3,000 airplanes. By 1945, we had produced 300,000 airplanes and defeated the Axis. In the 1970s, people were worried about air pollution but warned that legislation could damage economic growth. But the Clean Air Act of 1970 cut six categories of pollution by, on average, 70 percent, while the U.S. economy more than tripled in size. In the 1980s, scientists warned of the hole of the ozone layer, the hole in the ozone layer that could cause skin cancers around the world. Again, industry warned about catastrophic economic consequences, catastrophic economic consequences for trying to control that. But we negotiated a Montreal Protocol. 197 nations joined. Chlorofluorocarbon emissions dropped 95 percent, and the U.S. economy doubled. So we can do great things, and we'll need to if we want to reverse the trends and return our pristine reefs to their former state. So think back on your own coral reef moment and think of the stakes that confront us. And if you agree with the premise that nuclear is good for the climate, then ask yourself the question, what can you do to make the climate right for nuclear? Thank you.